Asian because in many cases, Chinese? It, it, they say Chinese, but the, it was an Asian community, uh, Filipinos, East Indians, the Chinese, mm -hmm. the Japanese. There were various communities throughout the state that were drawn upon. Mm -hmm. And as the railroad came through, more communities came in. And I was mentioning to, um, I think it was Charmaine earlier, or the village that, and we don't see many of these uh, businesses still in operation today because most of those businesses were owned by business people from San Francisco and or Sacramento. So they were just leasing out their property here. And so when we talk about California history, most of this piece of history, we don't even hear about. The, one of the largest inland, inland lakes in North America, back this way on the five, Tule, Tule Lake. And you know, when we get that 100 year flood, Highway 5 is going to be underwater. Um, so, um, the levees were built. All the levees were built by immigrant Asian communities. The railroad here also, immigrant Asian community, even though the Chinese get the credit for it, a variety of, of, uh, of immigrants from, from Asia. So even today, as uh, and I was hoping that we might, you guys might stop at McFarland and see the, the big mural on, oh, the, yeah. on, the, on the water tank yep. or the McFarland, the movie. Might be something you want to stop on the way I back. So, um, and I, I know these things because my family, my family's from Bakers, from Delano. Okay. They lived on Fremont. They were farm workers, and we eventually ended up in Bakersfield. I was born in Bakersfield, and then the rest of the family we all moved to Southern California. So I just wanted to share that piece of history because um, it's it's very often overlooked, as most of our history is. <laughs> These are just things that those of us that are from these communities we know about because our parents or our grandparents, in some cases our great-grandparents said, your dad helped build that, your great-grandpa helped to do this. So, mm -hmm. so thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, uh, you know, growing up in Delano, uh, we had like a, uh, Suzanne, about 20%, right? We're in high school, the high school population is about 20%. Most of our dads were, were farm laborers, they were contractors, or they just worked in the fields, and we, we were all part of that. You know, dad's not here, none of our dads are here. Some of our dads were in the Merchant Marine. We went to the, the recently there was a funeral for Helen's father, who uh, uh, was in the Merchant Marine, but still, the families were based here because there were so many other Filipino families in this area that they felt comfortable leaving to go overseas while their families were here in the, kind of the bosom of the Filipino community here in Delano. But we, we, we grew up, I grew up right in the middle of the 70s. So I was, I was, it was just, you know, started with rock and it was just, um, but it was, it was a great era over that time because everything cultural was kind of, you know, everyone was taking pride in that. Like, you know, the you know, Filipinos were out doing their thing and we were playing UFO, which is the name of our uh, uh, student organization. It's called the United Filipino Organization. And because it was high school kids who came up with it, UFO. So it's nothing as fun as that say, what did you belong to in, in, at your school? Well, I belong to UFO. United mm -hmm. Filipino Organization. You know, other people have, called, have different names for it, but in Delano, it is fondly called UFO. Mm -hmm. And it's been around since like 72, 73. We're trying to figure out exactly when they first gathered to celebrate their culture. Um, but this is, a, this is a town that's not just, you know, 10% of people who of the students identify as Filipino, and then there's like 30, some 3,800 that, that are uh, Mexican, but there's a group, and it's like 10% again, of people who put other, they're not, they are, depending on who, which parent you're talking to, they're either Filipinos or the Mexicanos. <laughs> because, <laughs> so, you know, uh, and in that generation, I mean, this is, this is a place where, uh, there's a web, there's a Facebook. Everyone's got a home chat that says, you know, you know you're from you know Delano if. And one of them was you eat pork and double wrapped in a tortilla. <laughs> you know? Uh, my my sister's husband, uh, they, their family sometimes will take lumpia and dip it in salsa. You know, it just it just depends on how you blend the cultures. And that this community has really blended its culture well. 
know we're part of a, a greater culture, yeah. you know? And uh, I've lived here my whole life. I am a school nurse at the Carlin Unified School District, so yes, I knew Jim White and all the DS boys. Mm -hmm. um, they all, they, two of them are uh, educators now. Uh, so, you know, they're very much involved, and, and Coach White still lives at McFarland, so. Um, and we get tourists, it's really great. We'll get people coming and go, is this the place? And we're like, yeah. Can I get a t-shirt? And I'm like, well, <laughs> just prefer them. But um, Delano has its own claim to fame. In Delano, though, and this might be why we have a hard time celebrating, we can celebrate our culture, and then the kids are well known. Our, our, our student dancers are really, have carried on a tradition of, of wonderful performances. But when it comes to the labor part of it, it's not always a shiny moment. Because this is a place where, where we struggled and fought for our, for our parents and, and their rights as farm laborers. But, the, you know, for me, and then I do this week and I say this because it's still, regardless of all the good the union did, a farm laborer was only been paid for by a grower. No farm union ever wrote a check and paid a farm laborer's wages. No matter what we talk about with the growers, they're still the ones who pay the wages to those farm laborers. But we, in those in the 70s, they were really vilified, regardless. They were they were bad guys. I mean, I don't say, and some of those guys are really rude. Um, that but, was how uh, I went to school with their children. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, the thing is, at Delano High School, I sat, I live, right now, I live next door to Martin, I live next door, he, he's retired, he's he passed away since. I live next door to Martin Zaninovich, who was the president of the Table Grape Association during the 70s. And I live next door to him now. But I went to high school with his kids. We were friends. We're still friends. They text on him when I want. But that was, the high school was the one place where we could make fun of Lewis Handel. It was part of the big, huge Three Brothers Handel Corporation, oldest son of the second son. And uh, the Lewis was kind of a goofy little nerdy goofball. And we used to make fun of him. I used to tell the boys, like, well, guys, don't make too much fun of him. He's going to sign your paycheck eventually. And <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> He's, you know, but, they, but in, in high school, we, we, we were more equal than I think we were. Right. Right. And you know what? Uh, education was an equalizer. Yeah, and you know, and, and the, the generational divide between my, my mom and dad's generation, of course, th there's that, they grew up in, in, a, in, in a United States, controlled uh, possession, right? Before the war, uh, the Philippines was part of the United States. Yeah, we, we were a commonwealth of the United States. And so, so uh, my mom and dad, here, here's what they taught me. If the grower shows up, we, we've got to defer to them. We've got to keep our heads bowed. We can't look, look at them in, in, in the head. We, we're supposed to keep working. And, uh, and so there was that difference. And then. Uh, when we grew up, we would say hey to the grower's son because we played basketball or football together. So there, there, was, there was a cultural gap between generations. Mom and dad always thought that they were going to work for the growers. We also, the growers is just, that's, that's Marty's dad, <laughs> right? That was Lewis's dad. So, so it, it was kind of a, a rich environment that we grew up in with the, with the during the during the strike, though, it was a, Delano was not a, a unified town. It was it was very very split. There, there, the, there were still yeah the uh, the freeways. It, it used to be the railroad, but now it's the freeway. They separated the east from west. East side is where the growers were, where, where the money was, uh, and then the west side where where the worker class. And I, I grew up in the west side worker class. I I knew no farmer kids, but then we all merged into the same high school. Um, when, whenever, uh, uh, when it was Wednesdays, and it was days for catechism, right? Uh, they, they would release us early to go to uh, the Catholic church for a Catholic education. The, the uh, Fremont school would be empty, because we were like 100% uh, either Mexican or Filipino Catholics. Uh, there, there was, there was like two communities grown, grown together. Uh, now it's, it's one big melting pot, which is you know uh, some emblematic of the United States today. And I think, I think, I think that's, I think that's what we're trying to get to, right? We're trying to get to a society where, 
we're, we're colorblind, we, we accept each other's differences, and, and we, we, we celebrate each other's differences. So I think we're, we're in a good place right now in the Laino. So, uh, uh, oh, a couple of things. Uh, uh, I brought a couple of books that I keep co always close to me. Anybody who, went to, anybody who went to college and took ethnic studies in the 70s was familiar with Carlos Mulasan's America's in the Heart. Uh, this was written by a gentleman very, I, I consider it to be like the John Steinbeck of the Filipino, uh, uh, in the Filipino genre, but he wrote about his experience here as a, as a, as a, a single male worker recruited in the United States to work. He had no money in his pocket. He landed in Seattle, Washington, and, and basically uh, uh, ran, the, ran the migrant labor uh, circuit throughout. And he talks about, you know, life back in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, San Francisco, where there was there was a lot of uh, uh, cultural differences, if you will. Um, very, if you have a chance, read it. Uh, kind of uh, gives you the Asian American perspective. The other, the other book that I picked up was uh, about Philip Veracruz. He talks about, uh, um, he, he was a, uh, he came when he was in his early 20s, like in the early 20s, and uh, he, like Carlos Bulasan, he, he just came in here to, to work and stuff, and uh, he got involved with the uh, with the, with the farm workers movement and uh, uh, George is familiar with Philip, right? Yeah, Philip was the uh, Philip was the spirit, right? I think he was the philosophical spirit behind the labor movement. Uh, Cesar Chavez was the charismatic, uh, unifying leader. Larry Itlion was the tough as nails, uh, brass tacks. He would cut your throat if, if he needed to. And Philip was the, uh, the, the, the philosophical guy. He was the guy that believed in the movement, in the cause. Uh, very eloquent uh, writer, very eloquent speaker. The union used him to go out to the colleges to talk about the, the strike because he was very, very eloquent and, very, uh, and spoke about the condition of the, of the farm workers here. So I would recommend this, uh, this book to you guys. And, uh, um, Hopefully we can get the, uh, the story of the Filipinos uh, out here.